Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jerome Bailey, and I'm with the ESRD NCC National Coordinating Center. Thank you for joining us today for the ESRD NCC Patient Education Webinar event. Uh, the ESRD NCC webinar events are held in partnership with the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. The calls feature patients and professional subject matter experts from around the country sharing how they or their organization are coping with situations related to COVID-19. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to let you know this call is being recorded and will be posted to the NCT COVID webinar webpage, usually within 48 hours. So let's take a look at the agenda for today's call. Uh, today we are happy to have Rick Olin Numezi and Ann Pugh, both patient services managers with ESRD Network 17. We also have two patient volunteers on the call, Derek Forfang, uh, a transplant recipient, uh, NPFE Land and Network 17 patient advisory member. Uh, we also have Carrie Esser, uh, who is also a kidney patient uh, and a patient subject matter expert for the ESRD Network 17. So our topic, uh, guidance and tips for multi-generational homes during COVID-19. So what's this call about? You will hear tips to empower yourself to cope with COVID-19. We will share some real world experiences that you can put to use. We have some resources for you to use and share with others. And this, ser and this series of calls is available to you offering a variety of topics. Uh, let's learn more about our future speakers, Rick Lynn and Ann. First, Rick Lynn is a licensed clinical social worker in California who has been in patient services with the HSAG ESRD Network 17 since 2013. She received her BA from the University of California, Santa Cruz, and her Master's of Social Work from the University of Southern California. She has 20 years experience in mental health, geriatric, and medical social work, 14 of which are in the dialysis and transplant area. She made a jump from mental health to medical social work after a family member was diagnosed with ESRD and had to start dialysis. She was born and raised in San Francisco and currently resides in, Sacram in the Sacramento area with her family and pets. Hey, Rick Lynn. Ann Pugh is uh, also a patient services manager at HSAG ESRD Network 17. She has more than 20 years of experience in healthcare, including seven years in patient services for the network, uh, she has worked as a dialysis social worker for 13 years and uses her assessment and med mediation skills to work with patients, staff, and family members in both crisis and support situations to meet the patient and their family where they are. Uh, Ms. Ann specializes in facilitating patient and family adjustment to changes in health status with an emphasis on trauma-informed care. We want to welcome both Bricklin and Anne to the call. As, now, as our panelists go through their presentation and you have questions, please submit them using the chat feature through WebEx or the Q&A on the lower right of your screen. When we get to the question and answer section of this presentation, we will share the questions we have received with our speakers. Our goal is to answer as many questions as time allows. I will now turn the call over to Rick Lynn and Anne. Thank you both for being with us. Thank you so much. We are honored to be here to present on this important topic. Uh, pretty much COVID-19 seems to be all that we think about nowadays. So I wanted to kind of open up real quickly with a little caveat, and that is that uh, Rick Lynn and I are both social workers. So although we will kind of be giving some tips and tricks to kind of deal with the medical worry and minimizing risk for families around COVID-19, um, nothing will substitute for talking with a medical professional if something is happening to you. And given that uh, every household and family dynamic and situation and health status can be different, uh, you know, this, this is a start to the conversation, this call. We wanted to kind of give some, put some, uh, our patient, patients that will be on the call will talk a little bit about their family situations, 
but uh, mostly it's just to kind of get that conversation going. So uh, is it good to have you today? Um, I'll be ready to go to the next slide, please. So one in five Americans live in a multi-generational home, and the reason this is from 2016 is that we don't have the current census numbers yet. Um, so this is kind of a combination of information, both from the census, the last census, and also from Pew, the Pew Research Center, which is a lot of kind of uh, population-centered analyses. So this was a survey that kind of showed the number of Americans in a multi-generational household, um, 64 million people, that's a fair number. And then demographically, in terms of racial and ethnic groups, breakdowns, it's more likely that people of color are to are in, um, I'm sorry, I don't know how to mute that, so that's going to just have to keep hanging up. Uh, but uh, so that means that whites are less likely than other racial and, gener and ethnic groups to live in multi-generational households. So um, moving forward, I, I just kind of wanted to frame that. This is a big problem, and it affects a lot of us, patients, and we are all patients in the end. Thanks a lot. Ricklin, you're up. Okay, thanks, Sam. So what is a multi-generational household? Um, there are many combinations that can form a multi-generational household, uh, but it's basically a household where there are more than two age groups living in the same home. Uh, you often hear of the sandwich generation where adults with children who also have their parents uh, living with them. And one of our speakers later today is an example of this. Uh, it could also be any family members of different generations living together. And one of our other guest speakers, uh, who we'll be hearing from in a bit, uh, lives in this type of household. Um, next slide, please. So it's important that people living in multi-generational households prepare in case someone becomes positive and also try to take steps to prevent this from happening. Uh, backup plans should also be created because anyone of any age can get sick with the virus. Uh, if the household includes at least one vulnerable person, whether that be due to their age or ESRD, then all family members should act as they themselves are at higher risk. Uh, sometimes people talk about the, the risks and, and concerns of living in a multi-generational household amid COVID-19. However, it's also important to acknowledge the strengths. Um, these strengths can also be protective, especially when it comes to staving off feelings of isolation. So for strength, uh, multi-generational homes can pool resources, uh, both financially, but also of other things like time. Um, for example, there may be someone who can transport um, a patient to their medical appointments, um, like dialysis, instead of having to take non-emergency van service or, or public transportation. Um, or there may be someone in the house who can run errands, like uh, picking up medication. Uh, there may be also more people who can help out with the chores. Uh, one tip is to discuss this ahead of time and, and not assume who will do what. You know, possibly create uh, a rotating schedule so that you know, not one person will be, will be um, burnt out. Uh, having multi -generations, multiple generations under one roof uh, can also strengthen relationships and, and deepen connections to your culture, especially if you have family members who are immigrants or maybe first generation here. Uh, personally, when, when my mom was living with, with my family before we moved further away from San Francisco, uh, she taught my kids uh, phrases in Tagalog and we'd sit around and make traditional foods together. Um, to this day, my, my 10-year-old uh, can roll a really tight lumpia, which is similar to an egg roll. Uh, now, during the pandemic, we video chat more than ever with even our extended family. Uh, my mother-in-law, who lives on the other side of the country, teaches my kids basic Igbo, uh, which is a language in Nigeria, and has them practice a little bit every time we video chat. So even within the household, you can still also, I guess you could say, virtually open your doors to other family members and friends and, and other parts in other areas. Um, Family members who are also uh, family members are also present to assist with child uh, or elder care. Um, also, for families who have, who have already been living with someone with ESRD uh, for a while, they are already aware of the risks and, and may already be sensitive to their loved one's needs. Um, patients in dialysis clinics receive a lot of education from staff, which thankfully are fact-based, often from CDC or, or CMS, which often gets passed on to their families. So these family members then start off at a different place when it comes to learning about things like infection control. 
Um, and this prior knowledge um, may help when it comes to discussing important things such as you know, hand hygiene. Next slide, please. Um, and Hi. So we, so we have several important tasks that we wanted to highlight for this presentation. And another caveat before I go into those tasks is that we're aware that some families often don't have any choices about all being together in a particular household. Not everyone um, has the opportunity to maybe have one member move out. So we're kind of basically assuming that people do not have options to split up households, and we're trying to help people figure out how to do well within the household they have, the layout they have, and the needs that they have. So the important tasks that we were going to focus on today, Ricklin has already in, indicated about finding factual and up-to-date information. Um, information is changing day to day, and there are all kinds of different sources. There's also a fair amount of chatter of things that may not be a completely accurate or may even be trying to intentionally mislead. So it's important that we double check where we get our information. It's important that patients attend all dialysis treatments and important medical appointments. Uh, you do not want to end up in a hospital uh, be, need, be needing to be checked out for something and also be needing dialysis at the same time. People are probably aware that uh, patients with COVID-19 are more likely to need renal support. So for a dialysis patient, if you can uh, call your clinic and see if you need dialysis and get that done safely first, it's always better. Um, we, it's gonna be important to practice excellent hygiene and house cleaning. You need to plan how to access food and medications. There's all kinds of stuff with accessing technology that's important for us all to learn. Managing anxiety and boredom, stress, staying connected, these are things that are important when you've got a whole bunch of people, often with different ages, all in the same area, spending time together and trying to stay safe. Thinking ahead, developing emergency planning or backup plans for child and elder care, also very important. And then what to do if somebody has COVID-19 or may have COVID-19. Uh, always seek help from medical professionals, but there's some few basic things you can do on your own until you get that advice. And also for dialysis patients, especially since you guys need to leave the house um, for, for dialysis support, uh, you need to think ahead about to problem solve and plan for any transportation needs. Uh, next slide, please. Thanks, Sam. So the MCC developed an excellent resource about where to find credible information on COVID-19. Um, this, along with other, uh, a number of other helpful resources, can be found on their website. Uh, once you find credible sources, check their site often uh, because there could be updates um, that will keep you up to date. Um, this is a new virus, so guidance may change. Um, discuss these changes with your family members. Um, that way, uh, mainly because it, it may change your already thoughtfully laid out plans. Uh, some credible sources have social media pages. Uh, you may set alerts to be notified on your phone or through email of these updates. Uh, on a related note for your own mental health, you may want to limit the time you spend watching the news as this can increase um, stress and anxiety. Next slide, please. It's really important to pay attention to excellent hygiene and house cleaning practices. This is something that uh, there's a fair amount of uh, you know, information you can find through the CDC. There are particular uh, percentages of alcohol and hand sanitizers, but you certainly want to kind of start, rather than getting, getting, getting lost in the details, kind of develop a plan. Everyone should be okay speaking with each other and doing reminders. I think at this point in the pandemic, we're all feeling a little bit tired of wearing masks, all this worry, it's easy to kind of drift away from being careful. So an advantage with having a lot of people with vested interests that all care about each other is you can maybe ahead of time give each other permission to say, hey, don't forget to cover your nose, that kind of thing. Um, the other thing, is people with higher risk, say you've got somebody who's sick and you don't know what's going on, you should be careful that perhaps that's not the person taking care of that person until you know what's going on. 
Children, different developmental ages are, are something to be aware of in families. Um, some children may just need to be contained. A two-year-old you cannot rationalize with and say, this is why you cannot do this. Mostly you're just going to have to keep an eye out and maybe kind of keep things out of reach or clean after. Preteens, teens, adults, different personalities may make a difference. Some of us, like me, don't like to be told what to do and may get kind of grumpy. So these are things, you know, to kind of remind everybody needs to be kind and remind each other, it's each other that every person in the family is part of keeping the family safe. Daily chores could be split and rotated among uh, family members. Uh, anybody who's ever been a Girl Scout or kind of gone to like a uh, a group kind of lodge situation, there's the idea of a KP chart that can rotate and people sign up for what today's chores are. It can be a way of making sure things get done and done well and not kind of make it the same thing all the time and not also to leave all the burden on one person. Staying at home and avoiding crowds, uh, you know, certainly trying to be careful about, outside, about gatherings with other folks um, is something very important as well in terms of limiting exposure to other people. And, of course, attending all dialysis treatments we've also mentioned, as well as medical appointments. Medical appointments, you can also always ask the doctor that's prescribing whatever thing it is that you're thinking about, whether it's something that is urgent or whether it could be uh, done later or whether maybe it could be done um, via telehealth in some way. Next slide. Other things, washing hands frequently, washing them well. There's a particular technique to washing every little bit of your hands. Uh, Ricklin described to me this, I think it was a powder that she sprinkled on her kids' hands. You may have to remind me what it is, Rick, when we talk um, again. Yeah. But what was it? It was a germ. I have to run downstairs and look at the bottle. But it, 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 it'll okay. glow into black light. Yeah, so it's it's something where you have your kids wash their hands and this kind of gel, it'll show where they haven't, that spot they haven't hit if you show you kind of shine black light on it. It sounds a little bit like that stuff that dentists used to give us and we would chew it and it would show the parts of our teeth that we hadn't brushed well. That can be a really neat little visual uh, reminder to get everybody to wash their hands well, keeping one's nails short, that kind of thing. Also, having some hand sanitizer. I've got a little bottle of hand sanitizer that I have clipped to my purse. Um, it's just kind of handy. That way, if I'm not near a bathroom, I can certainly make sure that I can wash my hands if I've touched something that I'm a little concerned about. Uh, wearing a cloth face covering, there's oodles of those. The CDC has some good guidance on the which are best among those. A dialysis, they should be offering you masks when you're at dialysis. Um, same with other appointments. Uh, uh, physical distancing from folks. I've seen a lot of people looking out my window that are taking walks together, and you can see they're eight feet apart, and they're having a good old time. So one can kind of spend time with other folks as long as one is careful. And the same with being at, at, at fam in, in the family home. If you have any concerns that someone may be getting ill, you know, kind of keeping, figuring out some distancing is a good idea. Having some visual reminders is a good idea, too. Uh, kind of a system, kind of walking through as a group, like where, you know, where, where is a place that we can put shoes when we take them off when we come home? There are different plans depending on what people's jobs are. If you've got anybody from the household leaving the house to do things, I personally am very careful whenever I've gone grocery shopping in a very tight environment. I often change clothes just for the heck of it. It makes me feel good. And then... So just kind of little systems to help the family all be on the same page and to limit any kind of leaking of any issues. Next slide, please. When it comes to food and, and medication, uh, you may have more delivery options now than before COVID. Um, so set a reminder uh, to investigate what your options are instead of just automatically going out to eat or pick up medications. Many grocery stores now offer curbside pickup of items that you order ahead of time so you don't have to physically walk into the store. And also check out local outdoor farmers markets in your area. Um, you can also check with your school district if they offer food delivery for their breakfast or lunch programs. Uh, there are some local churches and community centers that may also offer uh, delivery services or volunteer services to run errands. 
uh, this may be a, a good time to look into uh, Meals on Wheels. Uh, some restaurants are cooking for the community at reduced rates, uh, and also many pharmacies ship medications um, to home. Um, in general, try to limit how often you run errands outside of your household, um, but you definitely want to make sure that you're stocked up on, on meds and your household staples. Uh, this can reduce the need to leave your home frequently. Um, for your local areas, you may want to check in with your area on aging um, agencies. They often compile a lot of these types of resources. Next slide, please. So there's been a lot of talk about accessing technology. As a matter of fact, some of us may be accessing technology too much lately, um, which is another topic we may address a little bit later. But one of the ways you can stay connected with folks and do certain things is uh, such as going to school or having an appointment with your doctor or attending church services by using um, devices such as uh, computers or iPads or Kindle Fires or little smartphones or even the good old telephone to kind of connect with um, other people. There are all kinds of um, interesting kind of things going on. There's all kinds of performances going on. Sco many schools this year are starting using distance and virtual learning. Um, uh, anybody who's got children at home learning can speak of this. I know Rickelin mentions uh, the interesting uh, kind of juggling of roles when you've got children at home learning while you're working full time and in, and in, in, in addition working on the telephone as Rickelin and I both do. So uh, technology has pluses and minuses. I'm sure everybody has been on calls where people are having issues with the mute button. So it's always going to be a good idea to kind of practice ahead of time. Say your church group is getting together to have a virtual kind of co coffee get-together. It might be a good idea to try to um, uh, log on early to kind of get used to what you're doing. There is help available online, the senior, and uh, you don't have to be a senior to have to be, a, be comfortable with certain types of technology. And indeed, many of us kind of have issues just because we're nervous or we're busy or distracted. So. There is, um, I really like this uh, website called seniorplanet.org. Their slang, their slogan is aging with attitude. And one of the things that they have is they have a, a, a IT line that specializes in helping people through getting used to some of these technology pieces. It's also a super accessible web, website. It's got a widget that you can change the font and the contrast and the distance between words and all kinds of cool things. It's certainly a really neat website to check out. Um, it's, you, can, you can join that group by it, pretty much you donate whatever you feel like and then you have to give one hour of your time a year and you can do whatever you want. You could maybe help moderate a group, you could show people how to crochet, things like that. So that's kind of a neat thing for people that are at home feeling isolated or people who want to learn something new or hear somebody else's experience. Um, back in the day, I remember being invited to a neighbor's house where they showed a slideshow of their, of their trip to Thailand. Well, that's something that can be done on computer now and can be really fun. Um, there are issues with uh, technology, of course. Uh, one needs broadband connection. Not everyone in the country has access to broadband. It may be a geographical issue. It may be a financial issue. Uh, maybe your provider just seems to have hiccups. Maybe there's too, people, too many people on. Um, there are various ways to work this. Uh, some go to kind of hubs that are well-wired. I've talked to folks that... Um, a certain number of university students are actually going to campuses to live there so that they have decent broadband access, um, maybe because their homes, uh, their home communities not have that same access to be able to do the virtual learning that's happening at this time. Uh, there's also wired community locations. Um, libraries are not, in some parts of the country, are open and are usually well wired. There are also communities that are spending money to get everybody well wired if that's the right word, I get, get, a, get a good uh, coverage, broadband coverage for everyone to get access to the Internet at a speed that works. Some of these uh, FaceTime or Zoom programs uh, need a fair amount of, I don't know, I think of it as like energy, but resources for, for the signal to work well. So uh, it's important that you have a certain type of Internet as well. 
then there's also the hardware piece. Uh, I know in my area, they um, one of our, our some of our uh, cable providers will help people with tablets, and also will give reduced internet for those who are um, have a child in school. Uh, so I think it's a good idea to check with one's provider to see what's available in your community. Anybody who has children in the home, the school uh, resource school district may have some ideas about either getting a computer. Uh, some districts are giving people or loaning people computers. There's one website here. There are many more about places to get access to the hardware. Nowadays, the computers or like little things like the Chromebook are a bit a lot. They've got they've gotten more affordable. And there's also foundations helping people afford these things. And then discounted Wi-Fi options is kind of what we've already talked about a bit. So uh, ask, ask about things that are out there. And of course, there are some, there's still like low, low, low price uh, landline access, but more few people use landlines nowadays. But some patients, it may be better for them to use an actual wired phone. There's a lifeline program. And I believe that's a national program, and that's really cheap compared to a cell phone bill. So sometimes it may be a good idea to use a good old wired telephone, um, and that, that may be a better option for some folks. And that way you don't have to worry about minutes and the like. So next slide, please. All right. Uh, so social workers who used to work in dialysis, uh, both Anne and I strongly encourage you to reach out to your facility social worker uh, to assist with managing stress and anxiety, and even boredom. Um, it's important for everyone in the household to take care of their mental health. Pandemics, COVID-19, stressful, and everyone reacts to stress differently. Uh, within your household, this time spent together uh, could be an opportunity to share stories and pictures and songs, almost anything from your family history. Uh, there's a great game that my family and I sometimes play when we have family visit called the Storymatic Rememory. You pick a few cards from the box and you start your story. And some of us will choose to just to write it out or, or just speak. Um, some will do like a mini monologue or act it out, and, and some even sing or, or play um, the ukulele. Uh, it's a really great way to, to share memories. Uh, brain games like Scrabble um, or old favorites like Battleship or Clue are also great to play together. Um, exercising, you know, walking or biking together as a family outside when the air quality is safe um, is another great thing to do. Um, there will be times, though, when we may need our space. Um, this can be hard depending on what's available to you. If you're in an apartment building and you have a rooftop, it might be, you know, some good times to have some alone rooftop times. Um, if you're in a house, consider spaces that you might not normally spend in, like your garage or a deck or a patio. Um, as many have posted on social media, this can be a good opportunity to learn something new. Uh, you can also learn that something new as a family or have someone in the family teach the rest of the family something new, whether it be baking or gardening or learning how to sew or knit, maybe an instrument, or even doing a volunteer or service project like making cards together for essential workers. Uh, next slide, please. As we mentioned on the previous slide, everyone handles stress differently. Uh, fear and anxiety can be overwhelming. Uh, some don't have the safest of, of coping skills. Um, there are concerns about the rise of abuse within households. Research in the United States and Canada are revealing an increase in abuse, though the, the data is still coming in. Uh, there are also reports of significantly decreased child abuse reporting since kids are not in school and having less interaction with the public. Um, now, more than ever, it's, it's very important to, to watch out for each other. Um, pick up that phone and go ahead and call a, call a neighbor. Um, so it's helpful to have hotlines such as these readily available. Do check in with your local county or state as um, they may have additional resources. So for example, the last two at the bottom of this slide are two hotlines that are offered through California agencies. Next slide, please. Okay, um, so especially in these times, it's really important to be proactive and plan ahead. Um, these are some sample questions to discuss with your family and, and possibly also with your medical team. Uh, one of our speakers will talk about his experience with planning and the changes that he and his family had to make <clears throat> or had to consider uh, when one of their family members was exposed uh, to COVID. Uh, some households have the, have the main caregiver. Uh, it's especially important to create backup plans. And also, we definitely don't want to forget about our pets. Um, 
Can your family divvy up the responsibilities for caring for their pet if that main person gets sick? Definitely topics to consider. Next slide, please. Um, other emergency planning that should be discussed if someone becomes ill is if that person shares a room with another mem family member. Um, it's safe and possible. Uh, open a window, try to maintain uh, at least six feet but between beds, possibly with a physical divider like a curtain um, if possible. Um, but if it's not possible um, and you have to, let's say, share the same bed, then uh, sleep head to toe, maybe with socks. Um, <laughs> If the person who is sick has to share a bathroom with others, then the bathroom should be cleaned and commonly touched surfaces should be disinfected. And if possible, open outside doors and windows before entering that bathroom um, and turn on the ventilation fan if you have one. And when cleaning, um, try to use disposable gloves if possible as well. Next slide, please. So, Here's, here's the worst case scenario. And, I, you know, having been through this myself, I work in a hospital. Um, when you look at some of the, the symptoms of COVID that are being listed and try to figure out if a sniffle or a cough or say you have a brief episode of not feeling well in your tummy, like how many, what, you know, what is the chance that I might have COVID? Could I have been exposed even though I'm very, very careful? Um, there are triage lines that you can call. Your clinic can be helpful with this. Um, the city of Berkeley, where I live, also has like a public health number you can call. It's always a good idea to know whom to talk to. Um, I recently had to speak to kind of a COVID nurse number, and they run you through a bunch of uh, questions, and then they let you know what they want you to do. Um, so there's a very – and, you know, taking notes is smart because when you worry – uh, and I must say some of the symptoms, like when they asked me about fatigue, well, I mean, you know, part of being a bit overwhelmed, working really hard, stressing, maybe doing things, extra things, like for instance, uh, you know, if I, if, you know, people that are raised, you know, having children going through schooling, some of us may be feeling very tired. Well, that's also a symptom of COVID, right? It can be. And there's a whole different, and, and it's becoming apparent at this time that, there is no partic particular one or two symptoms that always show up with everyone. I was just on a call this morning that talked about someone at a nursing home who turned out to be COVID positive, and the first thing that happened is they had behavioral changes. And I was like, oh, my goodness. But in any case, the good news is that, you know, certainly reaching out and talking to a medical professional, uh, their testing is more available now than it was. The turnaround is getting better in a lot of parts of the country. Um, so these are things to do to rule oneself out and also try to figure out what's going on within one's household. So with dialysis, if there's someone in your home that's being checked out for, for COVID, you need to let your dialysis clinic know. They may want to put you maybe six feet from the nearest person. They may just want to move your chair if possible. Ideally, let the dialysis know, clinic know ahead of time because anybody who's Ever asked for a particular chair analysis? Boy, does that get complicated, right? So, um, and also often the machines are set up by the time you get there, right? So, if there's so, call ahead to your dialysis clinic if there are any concerns, or if you've been to the ER, or if you have a test pending. Um, your dialysis clinic truly wants to know everybody's in this together, and they should be really cool and work with you. Um, of course, continue all the hand hygiene and the like. Um, I got tested this morning. Chances are low that I have it, but you know why not be safe, just in case. Um, especially if I'm going to be around others, around uh, others such as my mother who is 88, and you want to be really careful because I would feel terrible if anybody go around me, close to me, especially my mom, got anything from me. So be very careful, and you know until you know what's going on, keep yourself isolated. Wear your masks. Wash your hands. Um, same conversely, if the person near you has COVID-19, there are things one can do with arranging one's household that um, are, are, can be helpful to minimize contact with others. Next slide, please. So again, we continue with disinfecting surfaces. One can see, I mean, there are certain things that one touches a lot um, in, in outside in the world, things like elevators, doorknobs in, in the home as well. 
Uh, if you can avoid sharing things, if someone in the home has COVID, they should have their own things that can be put aside. Having one person take care of that person rather than everyone going in and out of that room or in that area of the home it can be a good idea. Um, and, you know, again, masking holds holds both for those that are caring for the person that is sick or may be sick. Um, so it's a two-way street. It protects both from transmitting and from getting it. So uh, using a separate bathroom if possible, uh, cleaning up after using the bathroom, flushing with the lid down. There's all kinds of interesting tips that are all available online. Oh, by the way, uh, the... The gel that I was talking about with Ricklin and the kids to show whether the children or even adults are washing our hands well, I know I miss the middle of my palms sometimes, is called germ glow. Um, so that's something that might be a good kind of teaching lesson if one really wants to keep an eye out, um, you know, kind of talk with one's family about keeping clean. Um, uh, using a separate, avoiding visitors. Um, and one can visit outside, distancing through windows, through FaceTime, through technology, and also just kind of being mindful. It's always easier to take care of other people. A lot of us take care of others very well, but being kind to oneself, uh, acknowledging where one where one is where one is at emotionally, kind of what your body is telling you. Are you having more headaches? Try to figure out things that you can do to make sure that you feel good. If you need some time to sit back or do some deep breathing, uh, uh, in general, our society is not that great with being mindful of our bodies. And this is something where if we are stuck with ourselves and having issues and we may not be around, be able to be around others as much as we want, or we may not be able to connect with people in the same way in our family about emotional issues. It's it's important to kind of figure out ways to kind of self-soothe and what makes you feel good, whether it's like picking up something you used to do, playing an instrument, there's all kinds of options. So next slide. Now transportation needs, boy, do we talk a lot about transportation with dialysis. Again, problem solving, planning ahead. Uh, you know, people, I, I personally am the shopper for all the seniors in my family. Um, they give me lists, and I make sure to leave things at a distance for them. It's something you can also do for neighbors, and people can do for you. If you're a mom with several young children, maybe somebody nearby can shop for you, and you can share the favor later. Um, always wearing that cloth face covering and making sure they, you know, you don't touch your eyes, you don't move it, that you keep it over your nose. Um, these are important things to t keep safe in this time. Um, we spoke earlier about having a reminder, kind of little little stickers and places. Uh, I don't know, I, maybe something near a doorknob saying, go wash your hands after you close the door, just to kind of remind oneself until these kind of become habits. And you know what, even, even when this is over, which I hope will be soon, there will still there are, are still be things like the common cold. So these hand washing ideas and techniques and hygiene techniques are a very good idea. In terms of riding in a car with shared van transport, that is complicated. The driver should be wearing a mask. Uh, you should, you can ask the driver to do so, or sometimes like social. I've talked to social workers who have called the transportation company and asked them to put, uh, make sure that their drivers wear masks. Uh, your other passengers should wear masks. If people are not doing that reliably, you can also open windows to circulate air. Um, you might always want to handle your own items. The less contact with others and other chances is, uh, you know, there's less chance of maybe getting, touching someone's hand and they've just touched their nose and then you could get, uh, get contact. And then also just kind of being mindful of not touching your eyes, your nose, and your mouth. Um, I have an, a little face shield I sometimes wear when I go shopping or when I work in the hospital. It does help me not touch my eyes. I never realize how much I do. And, of course, kids touch everything. So this is something in a multi-generational household you need to be aware. And say you're having to use Uber or ride share, you know, these are things you can do. Ask them to open the window. Use your hand sanitizer. Next slide, please. Um, these are a few resources I connected. Some of these are... Really nice to check out. These are hyperlinks that you can click on and then they'll open up the website. You can also just put in this text into the search engine in Google and you'll find it. 
So um, if you have a slide deck, which will be emailed to all the participants, you can click on these. Some of these are really, really nice. Next slide. Um, more more options. These are all kind of written, so they're not too fancy pantsy, uh, highfalutin kind of boring things. They're written with good graphics, and they're nice and legible. There's a few more internet options here, and there's a few more. Uh, there is something from the the Substance Abuse and Mental Health uh, Administration, the Intimate Partner and Violence. It's just it's something to kind of think about and be aware of. After all, we are a community. Um, if you're aware that a neighbor has children and you haven't seen them for a while, it's not the worst thing to kind of keep an eye on each other. Um, maybe children can have physically distancing play dates to kind of change things up. It can be a way of kind of making sure that everybody's doing okay um, in this hard time. Next slide, please. And that being said, Rick Lynn, I'll let you take over. We're going to move on to our patients for now. Sorry. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, we have two amazing guest speakers, Derek Forfang and Carrie Esser, who are both part of Network 17's Patient Advisory Council. Both live in Northern California and have long histories with ESRD uh, and are now transplanted. They're both coping well and staying safe in their multi-generational households. So we'll go ahead and let them introduce their lovely family members who are in their pictures. Derek? Um, yes. So in my uh, picture, you'll see to the far left <clears throat> is my nephew's fiance, Darlene. And my nephew, Andrew, is next to her. My sister's in the middle. Uh, next to her is my youngest nephew, Alex. And then my sister's husband, Mitch. And out of that group, two work out of the home. Uh, the youngest nephew is a college student. And the older nephew works from home. And so just recently, I won't take a lot of time, but recently, uh, my my uh, nephew's fiance is a social worker and just graduated school, got her first job, works in a family home with mothers with children um, who are trying to get single moms that are trying to get their education and uh, had been homeless. So uh, she works with quite a few people in this household, and um, one of the persons in the house became uh, COVID positive. So we uh, basically thought that we had a plan and we keep uh, hand sanitizer. I, I believe like they had spoke about, we keep a big bottle at the front door with a sign that says, remember to sanitize your hands. Um, we all have bottles, you know, they're in the kitchen, they're in, on the dining room table. And I make sure myself when I get my food or whatever and I sit down that I sanitize my hands before I even start to eat. Um, and so we thought we had a, a pretty good plan. We, we are cautious. The two that work out of the home, uh, I pretty much distance from, um, and my oldest nephew as well. And, uh, but we do sit at the table. We have dinner together. Uh, those two are at the far end. I'm at the other far end. Um, but we do live in a, not a huge house. We all have our own small spaces to go to. And uh, so anyway, we thought we had a pretty good plan. Well, then when she came home and told us that someone had been positive and we were trying to figure out exactly when she became positive, we realized that all of us in the house could be potentially positive. So it changed our way of thinking other than just quarantining her. It's like, how are we gonna break things up until we can get some results from tests being done? So because my nephews and, uh, and, and Darlene spent a lot of time together, the three of them were tested first. We started wearing masks in the house. We didn't dine together anymore. Uh, I dined by myself. Uh, my sister and brother-in-law were in their area. So we, we had to split everyone up. Um, and it, it kind of changed the way we started thinking about things uh, in the house. Uh, luckily, the test came back and we're all uh, negative, um, so that was terrific. And uh, Darlene had her uh, retest done uh, yesterday, so we'll wait for those results. Um, but it really made me think, you know, I've been out of the house once in the last five months for blood work, and I thought, you know, I could get this thing anyway <laughs> after all this time, you know, I've been uh, 
dealing with sheltering. So it, it made me kind of rethink some of the risks maybe I was taking that I wouldn't want to take in the future. Um, so we've been a little more cautious with eating. It's one of the things we enjoy, though, to when we all connect is sitting at the table. So I think you have to decide for yourself kind of risk versus reward. Um, you know, we all live in a house. We're a family. Um, my children don't live here in town. And actually, my son has coronavirus right now, and he's in San Antonio, Texas, and having a really difficult time. So it's definitely not something any one of us wants to get. Um, so, so from now on, we, we are not wearing masks in the house anymore at this point, but we are keeping our distance. I especially keep my distance from them. I spend most of my days in my area of the house, um, in my room, my office area. I stay real busy, so that's easy to do. And then in the evenings, I may be out watching TV, usually with just my sister, and uh, we'll hang out there in the living room for a little while. Um, back actually in um, late January, early February, I traveled to all places of Seattle where I, we knew we had just heard one person had it in the country in Seattle. And I thought, what are the odds of me running into this one person? I had no idea what this was at the time. And I came back from Seattle in mid-February really ill and um, was actually in bed for about four days. And we wondered if I had it. And at that point, they weren't doing any testing. Um, and then I traveled. I got better, took some antibiotics, went to Baltimore in um, early March and came back. Actually, I spiked a fever in Baltimore and came back ill again and uh, almost had pneumonia. And they treated me. I got better. And so early on, I decided to shelter after that, even though I had travel plans, I canceled all the rest of my travel plans before they actually were canceled anyway. But, uh, and I began to shelter because I thought, wow, there's some nasty bugs out there. And it, and it turns out actually that I wasn't positive. Um, I did an antibody test and I never had COVID, um, but it was a good reminder for me that I really need to get my flu shot because if you had looked at my symptoms, you would, you know, even my physician, was pretty sure that he thought I had it. So, um, so, so that's been my experience so far. And, uh, you know, it's difficult when my, actually when my uh, youngest nephew came home from college, he uh, self quarantined in his room for two weeks. Um, and uh, my sister brought food for him and, uh, but he stayed in there and we stayed away from each other for that full two weeks. Um, so we've tried to take every, um, precaution, and I think it so far has done well. You know, my uh, both of my family that work outside the home have told their coworkers, their supervisors, that they have someone at home who's kidney transplant patient and uh, very susceptible. And so, you know, she wear, wears a mask all day, whether she's in her office by herself or not, and won't allow others in her office without a mask. So, I think communication is another key peace with people outside your household that they may have to deal with. And uh, my brother-in-law is a construction worker, but even on the site, he wears his mask all day. Uh, he doesn't ride along with anybody else. Um, he takes his own personal vehicle out to the job sites. So he's not, uh, you know, and then he also changes in the garage, throws his clothes in the washer and comes in. So. Uh, so I think, you know, those are all key things we're trying to do to stay safe. And, uh, and it, I'll tell you, it's difficult and it's wearing and trying, but, uh, but so far, so good. So I'll leave it there and turn it over to uh, Carrie. Carrie, are you muted? Oh, am I there muted? There we go. Sorry about that. There you go. Okay. Oh, okay. So going back, uh, I live in Northern California uh, with my husband. There's uh, First of all, there's me, obviously, my son, Max, my husband, Brian, uh, my daughter, Brielle, and my mom. Um, we all live together. Well, we did before COVID, 
Uh, my son uh, is, a, is an essential worker at a grocery store, and uh, he was working long, long hours and going to different stores. He's an assistant manager in a department, so they, he was asked to um, kind of step up. So we made a decision. He had a friend that he could move in with. So he had to move out, and we all thought it was going to be very temporary. I think we all kind of felt that. Um, so we kind of went on. My daughter um, was doing um, was going to college, but uh, that moved to online. She was working at the time, but she was furloughed. My husband, um, fortunately, has uh, been able to work at home. And uh, my mom, uh, as long as I keep supplying her with a lot of library books, she's all good. <laughs> um, and um, she doesn't have any underlying health issues, fortunately, um, at 85. She does absolutely amazing. Um, um, I uh, obviously am the concern. I'm 30, uh, 30 years in end-stage renal disease, um, you know, at-home dialysis in clinic, and then I'm 22 years post the second transplant. So my... Uh, the kids have grown up with me um, being immunosuppressed. We've all been very well aware of it. So we kind of just went into extra gear in that way, being um, cautious and concerned and um, more uh, um, obviously following the mask rules and not going out. I think we were hitting it really hard the first couple of months. And then um, as time went on, um, my son realized that he just can't come back. Um, he, at one point, we thought he was exposed. I mean, in a grocery store, it's all around him, and it was very frustrating for him. Um, people weren't wearing masks, and so we made a decision that he was able to find somebody to move in with, and we've been able to help him out. Um, and so we were really fortunate that he could do that, and it's working out okay. And we don't get to see him very often, which is kind of sad. Um, my daughter... Um, it's completely switched to school online, as I said, and ended up um, going back to work in June. Um, but with a, the where she works, there's just an abundance of caution and masks and a limited amount of people um, in the store that she works. Um, my husband, um, fortunately, could work at home. He's had to go back out um, to some clients, so but with um, limited um, 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 exposure and mask and hand washing and all the everything that we can do to to not bring it back into the household is really what the the main point is. I am a very social person and that's been pretty much down to nothing, which has been I think the most challenging. Um, I do talk to people, but it it is kind of limited. I'm more of a one on one person. Um, we I get out by doing you know curbside. Uh, pickups um, and uh, go out to dinner if we do that in the car. We do curbside, my husband and I, and, and uh, eat in the car maybe. Um, but um, we do more walking than we've ever have, which is good. Um, and um, But um, I think the, the biggest challenge, um, oh, another thing is my daughter runs most errands, and then I've had all our meds uh, sent, uh, um, they get mailed in, including my mom's. I manage all hers now. And um, so that's been a good thing. So I think the biggest challenge is not having my son here and not being able to see him. Um, um, another big challenge is deciding what um, appointments, we, you had talked about that, um, Anne and Ricklin, about what necessitates an urgent need to see a doctor or get, get um, um, my um, labs done. I think that's important if there's uh, something as, as opposed to maintenance. Um, so my labs are a must. Um, um, those are some of the first signs that there's something going on. And then I've been staying in touch um, through uh, what's the Sutter online through the email system on the online um, system that way. Um, and checking in with all my doctors. Do I need to come in? Is it a necessity? Can we put it off? And um, getting their feedback has um, really um, been helpful, and they've all been really good in that way. From from you know, getting skin checks for dermatology, getting um, my teeth cleaned, and all those general maintenance things that have kept me healthy, um, and debating all those things. So that's kind of, uh, and just trying to stay sane, I think, has been the challenge, and playing games together, and doing a lot of more reading, and 
if we need to, we separate, we can, we're able to, fortunately able to separate and have our own space to some extent if we need to. And, um, and I'll go on a car ride or something just to get out of the house. And so that's kind of where we're at. I think that covers it. Great. Thank you so much, both of you. Um, Jerome? All right. Thank you, Rick Lynn and Anne. And I also want to uh, thank um, Carrie and Derek for sharing your stories. Uh, unfortunately, we do not have time for questions, but we, I do uh, want to turn your attention to a new resource from the NCC uh, that we created. Uh, it's a handout we'll called staying safe, in a, there you go. staying safe in a Multi-Generational Home. Uh, this tip sheet has inf helpful information for grandparents, adults, teenagers, and young children living in the same household during the pandemic. Uh, it even has tips on what to do to prevent the spread of the virus if someone in your home contracts COVID. Uh, visit the ESRD website to download this resource. And I wanted to let you know that it's available in English and Spanish. Uh, we also want to remind everyone about the kidneyhub.org. Uh, it's a mobile-friendly web app developed by the NCC with lots of input from our patient subject matter experts. It has information on home dialysis, the kidney transplant process, infection prevention, mental health, and more. Uh, I was recently talking to a patient about this tool, and she told me that the video about high KDPI kidneys was very helpful to her. So uh, lots of great information on the kidneyhub.org. Uh, check it out as soon as you can. Uh, as a reminder, our patient COVID-19 webinar events have moved to every other week. So our next patient event is Tuesday, September 8th. And the next professional COVID-19 call is next Wednesday, September 2nd at 3 p.m. The topic, telemedicine in nephrology. Uh, we want to thank you all again for being with us this afternoon. For additional COVID-19 resources, visit the CASA website at casacoalition.com. You can also review additional COVID-19 tools at kidneycovidinfocenter.com. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. <laughs>